now we can hear. Okay. Um, Hello, everybody, and um, I know it's already five o'clock, and uh, you already uh, have heard a few things about uh, DevOps, I think, already uh, today, three or four times. Um, I hope I will not uh, repeat uh, uh, a lot other speakers, but we kind of, I don't know, today we are circling around between the DevOps and microservices. So one more DevOps talk today, and um, um, I hope uh, I will not get you bored. And, and uh, yeah, let's start. Uh, my name is uh, my name is Anton Kranga, and uh, I work for Accenture. And uh, my specialty is the cloud domain, uh, and uh, I'm doing a lot of cloud architectures, and uh, um, and uh, uh, basically last I don't know like last several years, let's say like that. I'm, I uh, do most of my time and do DevOps. Uh, either within our project, either outside of our project. I'm doing lots of uh, DevOps consulting of multiple initiatives uh, within our organization. And uh, since, uh, uh, since that time, um, we already collected enough experience uh, and uh, we that uh, sometimes we see that uh, are happening with the devops uh, which is great sometimes uh, uh, not so great and uh, here i'm trying to just share something that uh, common pitfalls let's say like that that we capture it uh, like uh, all uh, several times uh, with the several uh, teams, several environments, several projects. It's uh, something that we see again and again and again. A um, uh, few things uh, that if, few things I will be a little bit uh, sometimes provocative, but uh, this is just one of the proposed solutions, uh, but because uh, um, I will propose a few solutions, but uh, again, uh, as we speak with the design and architecture, for uh, when you have one thing, you always uh, uh, resolve one problem and create another one, right? So they sometimes will be like a little bit, uh, um, little bit discussable, and uh, I'm ready to discuss after the talk. So let's start. Um, uh, why DevOps? And uh, I, I think you heard what the DevOps is, right? And uh, operations and the developers are uh, making the friendship, and uh, everybody is happy. And a uh, few things um, uh, we barely speak about. What are the uh, drivers, enablers for the DevOps? And uh, when we typically think about uh, uh, software development. We typically think about the price, right? So we uh, try to push uh, the price of the development down, and uh, by doing that, we uh, implement many things. And uh, but uh, in fact, like uh, the real DevOps enabler is actually when we want to boost innovation speed. Right. So uh, basically, if you are targeting on the price, just on the price, then probably there are many things that I will t tell you about will be a, a little bit premature for you. Okay. So a uh, few things uh, that we capture it when we uh, deal with the price. First of all, we uh, by pushing down the price, we typically introduce something that we call specialization. Right? So that means that we have highly focused engineers. One is focusing on the one specific uh, piece of technology, and other uh, teams are focused on the other specific uh, technology. For example, uh, we do application development and testing. Right? It's, um, and um, I sometimes ask the question, why can you do both? <laughs> right? It's a, why can you write the code and then test it? Um, so. Um, uh, another thing that we see is the when we in, uh, when we actually isolate people, like developers, I barely speak with the testers somehow, and uh, nobody speak with the operations, right? And uh, then uh, we we want to make our communication between uh, the teams are very 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 um, focused and uh, very hierarchical. But uh, speaking from the complexity theory perspective, we actually introducing uh, complexity. 
in into the of how do we communicate between the teams how do we uh, operate between teams and uh, and uh, that means that uh, uh, we basically slowing down all our uh, work right because uh, uh, if uh, I'm, I have done my work, I press commit, then I need to send an email with uh, somebody else and uh, release notes to the test team, then I need to wait when testers will start to do the, the testing and so on and so on. Actually, my pace is very, really, very really slow, right? So um, when we want to boost the innovations, we need to cut the corners. And um, one of the th first things that we need to cut is actually um, break the specialization. We need to focus more on the cross-functional teams and uh, restructure it. Uh, and uh, I a little bit later show uh, one of the proposed solutions for that. Um, but at the same time, uh, what uh, I found myself as the uh, driver, like navigator through the DevOps adoption is actually complexity theory. Take a look, uh, read about this, but uh, in the, frankly speaking, it's uh, just about uh, splitting simple things and complex things and uh, do simple things simple, in a simple way, and few complex things that you have in your system, do, uh, deal with it separately, right? And uh, one thing to remember is simple things tend to be chaotic. Don't be afraid of chaos, but uh, when you try to bring the order into the house, you uh, try to structure it, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you actually introduce the complexity, uh, and as the price for that, you will pay with the speed of innovation you will reduce your speed of innovation, right? And uh, then we have one more tool, which is uh, uh, everybody in the DevOps world like. It's a software-defined data center. This can be your uh, private data center. This can be a cloud, uh, many things, right? But uh, at the same time, we do not uh, treat the servers, the environments, as the uh, hardware anymore. It's kind of program. And when it's programmed, uh, we can interface to that as the programmers and uh, write some cool automation around that. Cool? So uh, taking all this in account, we actually found that uh, DevOps uh, and uh, um, uh, DevOps as the tool that we can use to actually to boost the innovation. And basically, um, primarily, it was driven by the unicorn companies like uh, Netflix, uh, Spotify, and a few others. Right, but um, uh, so, but I'm cam coming from the enterprise world, and let's see what's what's happening uh, f with the DevOps uh, in the enterprise adoption. Right. So uh, before we start, this is the, uh, my definition of DevOps, and uh, uh, basically, it's not just about the collaboration between the operations, etc. But it's just uh, if you are able to create the environment, just environment where people can freely communicate when they trust to each other and then can uh, really express the things, then you actually succeeded with your DevOps adoption, right? It doesn't actually, it's not the tools, it's not the processes. It's just uh, how to say the things, how do you, uh, how do you work with your colleagues, uh, uh, whatever uh, the role they have. If you share the common goals, if you share common pains and you trust each other, enough so you could just say to somebody, you do not need to write an email, and, uh, and even worse, uh, Jira tickets, then you're actually doing DevOps. So, uh, but um, first of all, uh, I've, I use my nose uh, to detect some uh, not so good uh, DevOps adoptions, and typically uh, is the same actually. Uh, it is the same instrument as I use uh, to detect uh, bad code, right? Uh, it works uh, with the culture as well somehow. So um, uh, one thing that uh, that we face is the dilemma, which is called unicorns versus horses. Right. Initially, uh, DevOps people were again they were like uh, highlighted by the unicorn companies. But uh, when you go to the enterprises where everybody are the horses, it's very hard to be, be stay still the same unicorn and say, "Hey, we will do something great, brilliant," when nobody can understand you. 
just okay, say, okay, yes, yes, you can do great, but please fill this checklist and do some, some other stuff, right? We, we have compliance audit to do, right? So um, that means that uh, the first challenge that we can see is actually when you still try to be the unicorn, right? So, um, as the kind of uh, side effect of this uh, is, uh, and the reaction of survival, you kind of um, put in your DevOps into the separate uh, place, separate field, and treat it a uh, little bit uh, separately, right? And then, um, you basically, when you approach the client and say, hello, I'm the DevOps, uh, they say, wow, cool, uh, uh, okay, can I buy it? How much does it cost? It's um, then, uh, it's something that the typically the many people are saying, like, hey, we need, uh, we need this, and, uh, but we do not really understand why. Right? And uh, in fact, we really do not want to change anything. We just uh, um, uh, treat it as the another one um, compliance or uh, another one methodology that we, we want to adopt. And, uh, and we need some criteria. How can we make sure that we achieve this uh, level of maturity in the DevOps uh, stuff, right? But in fact, it's culture, right? We do not have a checklist for culture, right? We do not have certifications for culture. Right? We just do it or we don't. Right? It's something within us and something we, between um, ourselves and our colleagues. Nothing else. Right? So uh, that means that uh, we cannot get like uh, KPI, key performance indexes, and uh, other stuff uh, that uh, typically managers, uh, uh, managers are C uh, wants to have. But uh, at the same time, when you approach the client, and say like, hello, let's do DevOps. And when you see this, one question I always think, uh, are they ready for do, do, to do DevOps? They sometimes uh, uh, people are just, it's a little bit premature and probably they, they need to wait for a while, right? So uh, another thing what we can see, this is another one, uh, another one, uh, um, Variation of the DevOps is actually rebranding. When they don't want to change the culture, they want, okay, we, we do the DevOps, and then they tr uh, just do rebranding. They still do the same things as they did before. They just uh, say like, oh, we are not anymore list managers. We just, we will be um, uh, somebody else. And, uh, and for that, uh, but they still do the same work, right? When, um, uh, when in fact uh, you just need to change the culture and uh, and uh, it will never fit into your ITL service catalog right so um, then what we can see in other like uh, common uh, stuff is like DevOps in the bio is the black box, right? Nobody understands what these guys are doing. They just uh, do, uh, making sure that something is still happening, but uh, nobody really have any clue of that, right? So, um, which uh, in fact shows that these people are not talk. They do not communicate, and actually, uh, y what you need to do, you need to open the uh, open the your black box and actually to spread. Um, to spread this as the culture to the whole uh, team, right? It's, uh, it's very hard to do the culture on your own, right? So uh, one thing, um, a word of warning, if you do DevOps uh, like almost every day or every day, right? Uh, try to understand, are you developer? Are you operations? Uh, are you sysop? Or it's, uh, but uh, why it's important? Because you need to kind of stick to, to something. Right, I position myself as the developer, but uh, I very often see that when uh, very mature DevOps engineers, they see like, okay, we're just uh, an admins and we do ad admin uh, sysop work in a very smart way, right? So um, another thing that we see is the sorting not my department. This is what I say. Uh, this typically happens when you start into forming um, uh, the separate DevOps teams, and uh, it's a little bit interesting. I, I would uh, I would um, refer you to the Martin Fowler website, and that was actually uh, inspired by uh, by him. Uh, and uh, this happens. Uh, 
when you actually try to uh, create your teams within your organization, within your, pro uh, within your uh, project, as they're very focused on the one specific, uh, um, one specific domain that they're doing. There is a database team, there is a storage team, there is a developer's team, there is a test team. When in, in fact, uh, and you can do agile, Right? But uh, in fact, uh, the things will move very slowly because uh, it's, uh, in order to pass one feature uh, from the UID into the production, you need actually to coordinate uh, very precisely how this feature will flow between the different team, teams. Uh, even they do Scrum, you as the kind of product owner, you try to persuade the teams to accept uh, the feature in a very precise order. <laughs> and then, I would say you are not do agile at all in this case, right? Because you're starting to put something like we call critical path on your uh, uh, on your agile project plan, right? So, but uh, what you can do, you can actually uh, form the team uh, as the autonomous that can uh, deliver feature fully packaged with uh, everything what it's needed just directly. Right, and just uh, bring all people there, and that's it. The uh, key challenge for that is actually how to balance, right? Especially when you have different amount of developers and testers and database engineers, etc. So uh, what we did in our project, we went cross-functional, just pure cross-functional, right? We even do not have the teams in our project, right? And um, we just form in the teams uh, per feature. When there is a feature uh, to develop. And then we, we have some kind of uh, uh, expert-based judgment on uh, this feature will require three, uh, three people to develop. And then we form the team of three people for specifically for this feature. Right? And then when the feature is uh, finished, we just disassemble it and, and that's it. Right? But um, this only works when you have relatively small teams. Right? It does not scale on the hundreds of, uh, hundreds of, hundreds of people. Right? With uh, like two, three pizza, uh, box sizes, it's okay. Um, one thing uh, we can also, also see is the um, DevOps uh, when they work in, uh, as the separate team. And by the way, if you're doing this, uh, read the Martin Fowler, uh, well, ThoughtWorks technology rather, about uh, forming the DevOps teams. And I know it was initially proposed as uh, this is something that you can do, but then they uh, published that you must uh, actually stop doing it, <laughs> right? And uh, I trust, uh, I trust to this because uh, when uh, we see that when the people are just doing the DevOps and nothing else, Right, they are kind of starting to um, isolate themselves from the uh, outside, from the old pain of the real, real world, and actually uh, try to focus on uh, try to build the DevOps culture within the one just uh, one small uh, team instead of when they need to spread it uh, outside. And from that perspective, uh, you can uh, you typically can notice this. Um, just uh, look at the Jira or any other ticketing system. The ticketing system actually is the instrument where you can study and see where are the silos in your organization, right? If you, if you just, uh, um, if you want to introduce the DevOps as the culture, just uh, trash out your ticketing system and just converge, uh, convert all the tickets, which are kind of repeatable work very often, right, into the self-services, right? So, uh, but uh, another thing that, uh, I always, I very often can see, right, and especially when you do distributed DevOps, right, uh, it's uh, you need to define like uh, architecture, etc. I would say the following: I write design documentation when I don't want to speak to somebody. Just uh, I, I create the design and uh, I hand over the design and say, "See you in three months." So. Um, another interesting thing is the definition of done. It's, it doesn't work with the DevOps, right? With the typical work that DevOps are doing is uh, not working because uh, things, uh, the DevOps are typically focusing on the automation on uh, something that we call non-functional requirements. This is something like we need to introduce more robust logging, we need to uh, better scale, we need to self-heal faster, etc., etc. And from that perspective, something that worked previously 
doesn't work like in a three, uh, after three months. And uh, the easiest example is the security. It's very often when you created a service which that performs well, then after three months something happened, and then you, you've got a very poor performance on your service. Right? Uh, so that means that uh, typically when you do the, um, uh, when you deliver the service, uh, let's say database provisioning service, uh, which is great, which is done, after some time it can be undone, it can be broken and, uh, or misbehave. Right? Uh, from that perspective, uh, it's uh, with the Scrum teams, when you say like, oh, we just delivered this service three sprints ago, and, uh, and uh, we don't want to, to put it back into the development. Right? It was officially accepted. Right? That means that uh, you are something losing with your communication. Right? And uh, actually, uh, the most of the practices that we do with the DevOps, we need to refine uh, and continuously improve the things that we deliver at once. So, uh, one of the biggest things that I can see is the fear of release. Right? Um, I always fear for myself as, as the developer for release, and I always hesitate before I want to release it. But at the same time, I understand that if I, we will release nothing, we will get no money. Right? So this is where we need a little bit to do some planning, some, some uh, preparation, some activities. But at the same time, there are tools that can help us to deal with our fear. And I very often find that this is more psychological than anything else, at least in the projects uh, that uh, I can see uh, around myself. So, um, and uh, another one thing is actually Snowflake servers. Right? This is something that you typically have, something like legacy infrastructure, we often call it, when you have uh, some bunch of service, servers that they were created some time ago, and actually somebody is periodically doing some manual tweaks on that. It can be manual, it can be semi-manual, but what we can see that every server, after some time, when you try to change it, it will have its own unique footprint. Right? And one change that work it perfectly in one server will just completely break another server. Nobody knows why after three years of running the same server again, right? And the three years of patching the server and uh, patching the database, etc. And uh, actually, this is, um, uh, this is one of the impediments that we can see in the con uh, when we implement continuous delivery. Right? Because uh, sometimes with the continuous delivery, we, um, uh, we do one batch of testing in one environment, and then we migrate to the another environment. And if they are not the same, then actually um, we can have something which works in one environment, it will be broken in another environment. Right? And uh, from that perspective, why do we do testing at all? Right? If we do not sure that it will work on the next environment. So, um, uh, let's start some with uh, some vitamins. So this is basically what we do to uh, to deal with uh, some um, unhealthy implementations. And uh, and uh, one of the things is actually infrastructure as code. If you're familiar what, with what it is, uh, uh, this is good. And uh, but uh, basically, whatever work that you do, uh, you should be able to automate. Right? And, there are f and uh, actually, if it's possible, just automate everything. There are a few, um, uh, I would say, um, superstitions that say that uh, automation is hard and automation is very expensive. Uh, with the modern tool, it is not. Uh, for me, I, uh, I noticed that I write the chef cookbook and I do manual. Uh, provisioning of the server it takes approximately the same time. The only difference for me is that I can re uh, repeat my chef uh, cookbook again and again and again on every server. Well, uh, with the manual provisioning, I will actually need to redo it again. Right? So you basically uh, you write your code, and actually uh, the code is something that is our common knowledge where we put everything what we know uh, about uh, this service. Um, and uh, we will use this as the contract between different teams. This can be development and operations team, but there can be other teams, like including uh, testing and uh, and uh, uh, product management, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right. So whoever can read the code, uh, they can they can 
uh, contributing to the code. And actually, uh, this is something that's where we can start our uh, collaboration in really, 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 uh, I would say, moderated way. Right? So, and the, uh, the basic tools for moderation, we use Git. Right, or uh, any other uh, version control system, but I personally uh, love so Git so much, so I would just, uh, I place it just everywhere, right? And um, if you, uh, the best thing that we can do is actually to put our infrastructure, express it as the code, inside of our application and let it evolve together. Uh, whenever I wrote any cool feature to my application, I add uh, some automation to my, uh, to my, um, infrastructure code and actually they are uh, since that they are the same so a um, uh, few things uh, that uh, we want to mention is one of this is how to f we deal with the fear of release one of this is actually we need to implement something like continuous integration continuous delivery we like this a lot, but this is just one piece of uh, the engineering work that we are doing a uh, few things uh, to be uh, to be um, to remember one thing is like I always do continuous delivery or, or continuous integration just to be uh, to not to afraid just to not to have like uh, wake up in the middle of the night in the with the fear that uh, something is broken right so um, another thing which is which we do we uh, do conti uh, continuous integration continuous delivery to get the early feedback as early as possible but uh, here um, please be smart enough because the uh, the feedback you tip you very often get with the um, emails Right, and if you're uh, very often when you continuous integration or continuous delivery system just spamming you, it's um, a few days ago uh, I was told by one of the engineers like, oh, uh, one of the services went down. Uh, I've got over uh, overnight I've got 900 emails. Right, this is something that uh, uh, when you get such kind of lot of emails, you typically you just uh, treat it as the spam and do not react on it. Right? Then what's the point of having uh, um, what's what's the point of having uh, feedback at all? Right? Then everybody is speaking like how many releases you have uh, uh, per day, etc., or per month, per week, or whatever. Right? Uh, what if it doesn't matter? What's the um, uh, what? What is important is actually uh, is uh, the size of the release. If your release is pretty small, it most probably will go smoothly. Right, and if your release is very high, even if it is uh, like it appeared after five minutes after the previous release, right? But it just have like fully full batch of feature, it may go wrong, right? Just um, when you plan your continuous integration, continuous delivery, just think about uh, how to shrink into to the smaller pieces as possible. And uh, I want to say hi to microservices now. And uh, another thing that uh, don't uh, judge your development teams and other teams uh, by the number of broken builds. When the build is broken, I'm always happy. I say, hey, uh, our unit is still working. They're testing something, right? But um, I very often can see that the people are too afraid to break the build. They're starting to actually send the code over emails. Right? Because whatever you put in the Git will trigger the build, the, um, then it will like you, it will trigger the big continuous integration, continuous delivery pipeline. It will trigger like set of pipelines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, you just uh, wrote the feature which is like half done, but and you want to share it with another developer. So, <laughs> right? So you just send it over email. What's the point then to have the Git at all? Right? What's the point to, sa to spend all these hours configuring your continuous delivery system if your development team is so afraid so they just uh, send everything by email? So, and uh, one thing is we need to respect when the, build are uh, when the builds are broken. I sometimes see that over and over again when the build is broken like for many hours or days or even weeks, nobody even cares like uh, if it's there. Right? Um, what I advice you to do as the point of culture is uh, actually to put uh, uh, to put uh, marker like uh, agreement like hey when the build is red nobody goes home right it's very easy to go home you just roll back to the stable release uh, just commit it uh, maybe with a force push right <laughs> build the green and everybody goes home 
right? And then uh, some uh, who broke the build, he will deal with this uh, like uh, later when they will have time. Okay, let's do some more hardcore, hardcore stuff, and uh, within uh, a few minutes that we've got, I will try to kill your brain. Okay, right. So. Um, First of all, um, I call it Jenkins-driven development, but inside of the Jenkins, the, uh, this can be any kind of uh, con continuous integration system, right? This is something that um, I very often see big, fat Jenkins server. You just put it, uh, well, let's say Jenkins, right? We just put it in the middle, and actually um, nothing can move uh, um, uh, just except of this server. Um, where is the, the problem? The problem is that if the server is down, then nothing actually works. Just nothing. Your development and your operation team can just go home and do nothing while the server is down. Right? That means that, um, uh, that, means that you uh, either you do not make the big fat Jenkins server uh, or any other continuous integration server, or, um, um, or you just, I don't know, like spend uh, many hours of configuring it and make it like uh, very robust and unbreakable. So, uh, other things that we see that uh, um, we, and especially when we do the microservices, the actual configuration management overhead that we get in is huge. Right? One, uh, to me, this is one of the main breakers of all um, uh, microservices adoption. Right? And uh, one of the things that we want to do, it's, uh, let's assume that uh, to, uh, what's the granularity of microservices? My favorite is just one, one function. <laughs> right? so, and, uh, and one function, it's typically one class. And then I need to create some infrastructure stuff. I need to create several de deployment pipelines, et cetera, et cetera. I write one function for uh, maybe um, one hour and then spending uh, three weeks uh, implementing all, all other stuff. Right, and uh, from that perspective, um, um, what if we will try to uh, um, analyze where uh, the th well, typically uh, for the services that we create, all jobs are looks more or less the same, right? That means that we can generate them, right? The only thing that we need to do, we need we need to express the jobs uh, uh, as the in sort of DSL, and we are done, right? And then um, uh, and then actually you can transfer this uh, uh, continuous integration uh, job creation into the self-service, right? Just the users who will consume this uh, job, they, they can generate as many jobs as they want, right? The only thing that they probably need to do to specify what is the archetype of your application, is it Java, is it Node.js, Ruby, or whatever, and probably something like a Git link and everything else can be like uh, generated. And then you can fine tune it uh, if you want. Right, but uh, once you d you've done it, push it, uh, commit it to the Git. Let it be part of your application and and evolve it together. Right, you add a new cool feature, and just implement it uh, inside of your continuous delivery pipeline. Uh, there are a few tricks how uh, you can do uh, how you can do it. It's called like job bootstrap, and uh, yeah, a uh, few things. It's uh, the speed of the uh, of the continuous delivery. It must be fast. Right, you must get feedback as uh, fast as possible. And actually, if you if you commit something and you get feedback in a three, two three days, sometimes it happens. I can see, then it's not enough. Right, it's just your uh, continuous integration is the single point of failure. Right, it's your bottleneck. Right, so uh, parallelize as much as possible. I really like uh, Elastic Build uh, to do this and. Um, a few other things, like manual promotion. This is what I see always and always, right? Do you have it in your company? Something like uh, you do, like uh, you put the code and then you do several iterations of testing, and then you ask somebody to take uh, to give the final look and say, yes, I like this, let's move it in production. Do you have it in your company who has that? Okay, yeah, few brave people, okay, cool. So what's the problem? The fear of release, right? It's uh, if I'm this person, I would be very hesitant and actually uh, to doing this. So um, what, what if we will uh, do this and we just remove the human uh, from this and put uh, some kind of delay, right? Whatever feature uh, I as the developer created, then I give maybe four hours or eight hours or how, I don't know how many hours you need to have the your test team have a um, uh, final look on this, and then if it's good, 
you just go with it. If it's not good, you don't like, you just uh, uh, need to have the something like uh, kill switch, stop the release, and uh, and uh, do, and uh, that's it. If you don't do it, it will go into production. Um, another thing uh, that we can see is actually what if we uh, do not do testing at all? Right? What if uh, the best testers are actually our users? <laughs> right? The, the, the only thing, uh, people who know um, uh, what's the good program, and they can distinguish good program from bad program. Right? So um, uh, the only thing that we need to do is actually to, um, to split the users into different focus group and actually try to use the feature as the early adopter right? uh, to the one group and to another group. And uh, another group will uh, do not have this feature, <laughs> right? And then we can compare the um, uh, compare the metrics. That, uh, by the way, uh, you can automate very easily with the telemetry tools. Uh, you can compare. Does is it really like uh, different from uh, like does the behavior of the user change it? Or if it's not changed, then why do you implement this feature at all? Why do you need to complete continue this, right? So this is how you can get the very fast feedback. Very fast, right? And uh, no user, no testers. Uh, another thing, uh, the code review process. Uh, do you have a new project, a code, rev code review process? Why do you have this? Why? It's um, one, uh, to me, uh, this is one of the signs, like uh, if you have the manual code review process, for, you're actually putting the same person <laughs> in the middle, right? And uh, that means that this person can be easily become the bottleneck, right? Because uh, it's probably a very important person in your project, like architect who must review all code, and, but he has other important things to do. Like, but uh, uh, what I'm saying, you typically put code review process I'm not against that, but uh, it means that you have lack of trust in your project. Sometimes it's good. For example, we have a new joiner in our project, and uh, yeah, uh, here is the idea. We have a new joiner in the project, and during the uh, knowledge transfer time, we really do not trust him. If maybe because he does not have enough knowledge about our project, he will commit something that will break everything. So we want to isolate him uh, from the other developers who we trust, and they will just commit to the master, right? And uh, once uh, this uh, knowledge transfer period uh, uh, completed, this person is earned our trust. Then we actually can uh, can um, allow him to like to do this uh, commit to the master, <laughs> right? A um, few other things um, that what to do with the master, and uh, here is the idea. Right, uh, something that reactive code review. The, uh, w that means that you, when you have trust in your team, you just commit everything into the master. But during the night, you have the nightly build that can calculate the technical depth. Typically, technical depth calculation requires time, and uh, it's best when you do it in the night because it, may, it can take several hours to do, right, with a big code code base. So that means that, uh, but. Uh, uh, that means that the only thing that from the technical depth we need to know as the development team who really trust, is it growing or not? What happened Why it's growing, right? Maybe it's something that we need just to push the release uh, today and then deal with it uh, later, right? And, and perfect time to deal with this is actually a Scrum meeting, <laughs> right? And uh, from that perspective, uh, features are just floating, floating directly, and then uh, nothing is actually bro uh, nothing is actually broken. Okay, and uh, I I'm gonna skip that one. Just I wanna tell you, just uh, remove the code ownership on uh, remove the ownership on the infrastructure. Just make the developers responsible on the infrastructure. They really want to break the things to see how does it happen when the service is uh, is dying, right? L let them do it, but uh, just if you broke it, you fix it. Very simple, right? If you have automation around that, it's very easy to do. So, and a uh, few things that I want to mention within one minute that I, I uh, left uh, for my talk. So, um, uh, the golden images, this is something that we don't like, and this is something, and actually, um, you, you will probably introduce some kind of provisioning with the tools like Chef Puppet or Ansible, etc., etc. Uh, while, in fact, uh, what is uh, important to remember is actually the provisioning success rate, it's never 100%, and uh, it requires some time. And, the, and it's even worse 
when uh, many things can be broken in the middle, and especially it will be broken when you put everything in the private data center without any connection to the internet. So you cannot download any software. So what you will do, you can copy all these uh, repositories, gems, etc. You can copy open source inside of your organization, or uh, you can introduce something that we call the steam cells. Uh, the idea of the steam cells, if you look, it's actually... Um, have a provision has the two parts, right? It has dynamic part and static part. Uh, so the only dynamic part is actually configuration. All the process of the installing, uh, downloading the software packages, compiling it, uh, installing, etc. It's static. It's always the same. Right, but these things are most likely will be broken during provisioning. This is just uh, um, you know, based on the experience. And uh, uh, from that perspective, let's do the following. You can uh, the steam selling is actually uh, forces you to make the snapshot of the static part of the provisioning uh, in the very controlled environment in your laboratory, right, where you have the full internet connection, you have full, um, uh, full. Um, access to do the stuff, and then, and then you uh, just. Uh, and by the way, you can use Parker or Docker. It's uh, the great tools for that. And then you actually uh, just uh, transfer a snapshot into the, your private data center, and you run provisioning there. Right. The only thing that you need to do is actually to um, spin up uh, just to update the configuration files. Just, and that's it. Right. And. Uh, Last thing, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, there are many slides. Yeah, I'm sorry, yes, just the takeaways. Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, spend time is actually of learning the patterns of doing DevOps because the tools are changing all the time, right? But the patterns are actually something uh, which stays with us for a while, right? Patterns right now are more important than tools because tools are like every Thursday, there are new revolutionary tool uh, appear it, right? Uh, second thing is actually uh, every, uh, we love APIs, right? And uh, and actually, uh, if the tool has an API, you can automate it. And uh, uh, write self-testable infrastructure code. So basically, assertions framework, you know the assertions from the C++, and uh, it's actually good, right? So for the infrastructure, it's very good on, uh, when you do ass uh, assertions framework uh, on the, uh, as the replacement of uh, unit tests, right? And a uh, few books to read. Um, so one thing is actually the human error. It's a very nice book about uh, accidents that happens in the aircraft. Right? Just, the hist just read uh, what things became, uh, why the airplanes are just falling down. Right? And uh, this is something that's uh, changed a little bit my mind uh, and, um, and uh, asked me to rethink uh, uh, all these DevOps things that we're doing. And the second thing, if you are a DevOps practitioner, right, read this book. Right? So, uh, be because uh, when you write the code, we write code for other people. Right, not for computers, but for the people. So, um, if you implement your Docker file, your uh, Puppet manifest, or your Ansible playbook, if it's readable, then everybody can understand it. Right? If it's not, uh, then well, I can write bad code in any language. <laughs> right? Uh, thank you. And uh, I think I have uh, minus one uh, question. <laughs> Oh, actually, it's uh, it comes from the experience, right? If you when you do when you talk with the different teams, uh, like for the last five years, and you, then uh, you typically have got like same questions to uh, they asking the same questions, right? Then you started to like uh, spot that well, if um, 
if you need to explain the similar things again and again and again, and actually you say like, please don't do this, please don't do this, please don't do this, but the people are still doing this, then there is something that uh, I would consider as the anti-pattern that happens. The, uh, the lean methods are very friendly to the DevOps, and actually what uh, I think, always try to think lean, right? That means that if, uh, for example, the Yes, uh, uh, the code quality, right? Sometimes if we don't do the same things, like, like for example, if we remove the test team from, uh, well, what we did in our project, we just removed the testers from our team and, code co and quality did not decrease because we just write the code and we test it, <laughs> right? Uh, so that means that if you can remove something without sacrificing of the quality, etc., then you do. But at the same time, you can add extra stuff like uh, review, uh, review to spread the knowledge which is nice, right? You always know what you do, but this is like with the design patterns, uh, like uh, they have like their own pitfalls, right? You introduce one procedure and you know what you will sacrifice, right? If you're, if you're okay to sacrifice with the, like, uh, like um, with the speed of the, your uh, features and uh, in order to get this, uh, like everybody like be familiar with the code, then, then it's okay. If you're not okay, then yeah, you don't. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much.